enduring almost unbelievable suffering. Two sets of parents tortured by the disappearance of their teenage daughters pleading for help. The pain I'm going through and not knowing where she is is unbelievable. Having fun, and you just said, See you tomorrow. At half past ten, we were going to pick them up. And she wasn't. <laughs> the publicity generates a rush of information. A local mother comes forward to report that she was driving to Tathra at 9 50 pm on the Sunday night when she came across a car stopped on the highway. Unable to pass safely, she had to stop. And in the light of her headlights, she can see two girls and a man standing by the car. There's enough light for her to give police a clear description of him. The car finally moved over, and the mother was able to overtake it safely and continue on her way. Another witness comes forward to say he saw a pink TV set abandoned on the roadside. It's just one of hundreds of small pieces of information offered by deeply concerned locals. It was all people talked about. You know, you walk down the street and everybody seemed to know them or their parents or their siblings or, you know, their kids went to school with them or, you know, it was, it was just what everybody talked about. I recall that turning up to the family's homes, there were people leaving the homes after dropping off some food for them. They were, they were there to offer them support. Hello. In the nine days since their daughter's disappearance, they've only had hope to cling to. Of just every day, um, you know, we would have big groups of people at our house. Mum would make heaps of food for everyone and we would all talk about what's happened so far and what we're going to do next. A few days into it, we searched all the areas we could. Um, we had to scale back the search. We expanded it to many kilometres, a uh, kilometre radius of the campsite. But then we had to make a decision to scale back the search, and we did. Most of the team returned to their stations, be it um, Nara, Wollongong and other places. And it left, uh, I think, four detectives here to investigate it. It's now almost a month since the disappearance. But just as the task force investigation is wound down, new information suddenly surfaces about a pair of violent career criminals, Leslie Camilleri and Lindsay Beckett. And it was just information from the police at Yass that you should look at these two blokes. They're into the badness, uh, they're into sexual assaults, and they may fit the criteria. Lindsay Hoani Beckett is a New Zealander with a low intelligence who at age 24 has multiple convictions for robbery and assault. Leslie Alfred Camilleri is a dangerous psychopath who since the age of 12 has racked up an amazing 146 criminal convictions. Police in Bega, trying to solve the mystery of missing teenagers Lauren Barry and Nicole Collins, are told about two violent career criminals, Leslie Camilleri and Lindsay Beckett. The two men have been living in Yass in southern New South Wales. An informant tells local police, who advise Bega detectives. The informant had noticed something in the newspaper, was aware of an article in the newspaper about the two missing schoolgirls. And there'd been a conversation between Beckett and Cameron Leary to the effect that I bet the police try and blame this on us. And they'd arced up about it quite badly. 
And that seemed odd to this informant who also knew that Beckett and Camilleri were in Bega. They check the background of the two and find Camilleri has recently faced court on six counts of violent rape of an 11-year-old child, but was freed after his trial was aborted on a legal technicality. He and Beckett are also under investigation for the abduction and multiple rape of a 19-year-old woman. The detectives then get a call from Canberra police with the news they've arrested Beckett after chasing a stolen car. And in the vehicle that he was driving was some bloodstained clothing in the boot. Let's go and introduce ourselves. Let's have a look at this clothing. Who knows, it could be the girl's clothing or something we can identify. Detective Winterflood drives to Canberra with Detective Stuart Gray. On the way, Gray is preparing for the Beckett interview by reading through various witness statements. He rereads the witness report of an abandoned pink TV set having been seen on the highway at the place where the girls disappeared. He starts to wonder if it's connected to the mystery and he comes up with an intriguing theory. So I was travelling with this detective and he said, you know, it would make sense if you had a pink TV in, or a large TV in the car that to get two girls in, you'd put a TV out and you'd put it beside the road. And I remember thinking, well, listen, that's just, you know, that's neither here nor there. It's really a bit of a nothing. So I sort of didn't give it a lot of credence. As I explained to you earlier today... When they interview Beckett, they find him arrogant and deliberately nonchalant. And towards the end of the interview, I put into him, uh, put to him, uh, and did you have this, a pink TV in your car? Well, the feet, you know, snapped down and he sat up and obviously I'd sort of, I'd hit a sore point with him. Uh, he didn't tell us much about it, but we just registered there's something about this television that's important. Beckett then admits to having a television set in the car in Bega, but he says he can't remember what happened to it. But I wish to speak to you further about it. So we started to work on the theory that maybe the TV was put out to put people in. So we thanked him for his time and, and we left. And we went from there to Yass to try and meet the informant. In Yass, the detectives discover that Camilleri and Beckett had actually stolen a pink TV set from the informant. And the, the main relevance of that television, he'd actually put Beckett and Camilleri um, at that scene. Oh, mate, mate, in the back seat, go to the TV, dump on the ground. Go, go, shut up, you bitches. Now, at this point in time, not only is Beckett still in custody in the ACT, but Camilleri had been arrested for some other unrelated matters and was in custody in Goulburn. Les Camilleri is interviewed in Goulburn jail, but as soon as the subject of the pink TV set is raised, he refuses to answer any more questions. Camilleri returns to his prison cell, where he's later reported to be in a distressed state, crying and banging his head against a wall. So we were in a situation where we knew that both of them were in custody, couldn't speak to each other, and this was a golden opportunity to work on their ability not to contact each other and their loyalty. The, uh... the detectives then subject Beckett to a second interview where they tell him they can now link him to the girl's disappearance. And I also had on, his, uh, on the interview table in front of him photographs of the two girls which I'd opened up and they were large sort of A4 uh, facial photographs of the girls from high school and he instantly turned them over and I knew I'd sort of hit a raw spot. Beckett asks to take a break, and while smoking outside, he suddenly bursts into tears and blurts out to his guards, they've got us. So they've marched him back into the room, and he said, oh, give me a map, show me a map, I'll show you where they are. And went, hmm, okay. So we've opened this map on the floor, <clears throat> and he started sort of looking at the Manara Highway and Bombala, and then he said, they're here, they're back there. Beckett then gives a long and detailed confession. 
beginning with how he and Camilleri inject each other with illegal drugs as they drive from Biga to Tathra. Liz was driving the car and we, we went on to the beach because I hadn't been to the beach for ages and we were going to go there for a drink yeah. and just see if there's any parties. And um, we were going up the hill and seeing these two girls there and Liz, Liz stopped. Hey mate, hey, what have we got here? <laughs> hey girls! Yeah. I asked if they wanted a lift. And they said, oh yeah, alright then. And then um, we said we're going, going to the beach and asked them if they wanted to come. And they said, yeah. The girl's families and friends are adamant that neither would have willingly got into a car with strangers, insisting they must have been forcibly abducted. You want to lift? We'll give you a lift, huh? No, I'll just walk. There were certainly no signs of violence. Uh, going on and it appeared that the girls were actually talking to the vehicle occupants and one of them was actually out of the car according to the witness so at that point uh, although maybe not a normal uh, or believed uh, action of the girls certainly on this occasion I think that that, that account is correct. They wouldn't have gotten in the, in the car with especially a car that looked like the way it did um, it was all banged up and dodgy looking, uh, these two were off their faces on drugs. And Nicole and I were both, oh God, you know, we'll, oh, we'll never get in a car with strangers. And she said to me, I'll just never do that. And I'd never hitchhike, I'd never do anything, you know, Dad would kill me. I'm still to this day convinced that they never hopped in the car voluntarily. They were either coerced into the car or through their mannerisms of Camilleri and Beckett, they were frightened and hopped in the vehicle. Beckett's version of events, he was accurate and, and truthful about a lot of other detail. I didn't see him gaining anything by saying they didn't get in voluntarily. Well, I think he lied about it to try and make it sound as though... Party on the beach? No, we can't. We you know, to make it sound less harsh on, on themselves. No, no, no. In his confession, Beckett claims they drove with the girls the five kilometres to Tathra Beach Surf Club, where they talked together while he and Camilleri drank a few beers. As the town was quiet, they then decided to drive back to Bega and agreed they would stop on the way at the campsite so the girls could tell the others what they were doing. They've travelled on a uh, dirt road uh, towards this campsite area and it's uh, during that, that travel where 